alcohol is a perfect example of one. You know, you often hear that the blue zones, all except for Loma Linda, they all have a little tiny amount of alcohol on a regular basis. Now, can we infer that alcohol is good or is that that population can handle it because the rest of their lifestyle is organized? We don't know yet, right? Or unless if you know. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I, have, a, I have something to say about alcohol uh, because I get asked this all the time. Dr. Lee, red wine's good for you, right? Well, now, now I just read that red wine's that the wine, all wine's bad for you. All, and what I basically say when it comes to alcohol, because it's 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 a it's a it's a triggering and somewhat controversial uh, point. It is true that many epidemiological studies have shown that you know drinking a glass or two, very moderate red wine, is associated with some beneficial out, health outcomes, lower risk of some diseases. But I will tell you that. In no study, no research is alcohol, ethanol, okay, the stuff that's underlying, you know, your whiskey, your <laughs> beer, uh, uh, your your wine. It's the alcohol is not actually good for you. Alcohol is a toxin, actually. It's a it, it's a it, um, and and so a little bit though, as you say, if you're mostly healthy and your health defenses and your metabolism is very resilient, human body is amazing. There's no such thing as a super food. It's a super body. Um, and even if we we slug down a, a glass of wine or, or sip a glass of wine or have a drink or two, um, our body will bounce back. It's o- only, again, continuous abuse of that system that will actually break down our engine. But alcohol is something very specific. And here's how I explain it. As long as humans have been growing grain, they've been fermenting it and creating alcohol. Alcohol is part of human tradition. We celebrate main events of our life with it, you know, births, deaths, you know, holidays. It's all part of, it's all, alcohol is part of human society. I don't think we should demonize alcohol. I think that, you know, it, we should just recognize it's part of, it's part of the traditions of human, human tradition, but we should know that uh, in no case is the ethanol actually good for you. It's just something that we, we do. All right. Um, but that, you know, and that's why we should actually think about it as a tradition rather than as a health food. Yeah. Uh, and I think that allows us to actually um, accommodate it uh, in moderation uh, in ways that are actually going to be uh, allowable if that's your preference to celebrate, you know, uh, a wedding with a glass of champagne. Like there's no shame to it. That's a human tradition. We're all human. Uh, embrace that part of who we are. And that's, I think, the thing that I I try to, that's my contribution in the health and wellness community. I try to use science, but I also try to be reasonable and I try to recognize who we are as humans. The nuance, right? That's where everything is heading towards. Not all answer for everybody. We're going to sweep it under the table. You know, everybody's got to do the same thing. And generally speaking, if you have all these other components, whether it's alcohol or diet soda that's occasional here and there, it's not going to make a difference. You'll bounce for you, back, right? You're going to bounce back. There's plenty of other crazier things that people do in life. So this goes back to the ten principles that you talk about in the book, and that you close off the book with. And I'm just going to pick a few. We're not going to run through them all. You know, pick up the copy. Pick up a copy of the book. Link in the show notes. You can go through them. I'm going to pick a couple of these that you know we can talk about here. Um, the first one that I want to do is I want to pick something called drink the Trinity. So what is, what is that? What does that mean? And what is the Trinity? Well, in my book, in the part about food, I take people on, I take my reader on a tour through the grocery store, including to the beverage section. And th- literally the way I do this is actually, I invite you to jump into my shopping cart, like you would have when you were a kid in your mom's shopping cart, get pushed through. And I kind of narrate all the things through it. So the beverage section of the grocery store is a pretty confusing section because it's in the middle aisles and there are endless sea of juices and sodas and bottled waters that are there. And so I try to bring a little bit of clarity to, you know, what are the three beverages that are um, unquestionably healthy f- for you? There's no real controversy of them, all right? Because other drinks like juices and sodas, lots of controversy, lots of data. But the three things I call the holy trinity of beverages um, are water, okay? Water actually uh, is critical for hydration, critical to maintain our health defenses, critical for our metabolism. You need water in the system, okay? Uh, And drinking water is something that is very natural and and important to us. Uh, uh, 
Uh, and when, again, when you drink cool water, you activate these uh, temperature gauges in our stomach that are triggering our metabolism to kind of warm up uh, the water in our stomach so we don't cool our core body temperature. So there's even metabolic benefits uh, to drinking water. Water is also by satiating. So when you actually drink water with a meal, you're naturally stretching out your stomach a little bit. And rather than actually having food in there, that water stretch actually basically slows down your appetite, slows down your hunger as well, which also helps to contribute to preventing you from overeating as well. So water is really good for you. There's no, you know, like it's a, it's a human right to drink water. <laughs> you know, we, we have to drink water. It's really great. Footnote to that. And this is actually something that I think really deserves um, careful uh, research, more careful research is, you know, bottled water, which is so commonly consumed, probably will have microplastics in it. Almost certainly does. And, you know, even though the research doesn't, hasn't clearly nailed what the harm of microplastics are, I would say it's probably not so good for you. We can find it like attached to a red blood cell circulating in our blood. That's, that freaks me out. Actually, think about that. So, if you can drink water, if you can if you can drink water from a source other than bottled water, it's probably preferable. Yeah, but get a filter at home. Get a filter at home. I, yeah. I, there's a great quote that a friend said years ago, uh, an acquaintance said years ago. He said, "Either you get a filter or you become the filter." <laughs> That's actually really true. And our kidney is going to be the filter, and our bloodstream is going to become the filter. Yeah, you don't you don't want to be uh, you don't all that. accumulating these microplastics. Um, but the water is really really a good beverage. Second is tea. We talked a little bit about green tea um, as being beneficial to you. Um, and you know, tea is the second most popular beverage in the world after drinking water. Uh, so we're talking about something that a lot of people have a lot of experience with. But I, but what I point out in my book is not just green tea. It's different kinds of green tea. Matcha tea is actually good for you. Oolong tea, which is slightly fermented green tea, also has metabolic benefits, also has polyphenols. And then for green tea, if you have matcha, you know, which you find in a ceremonial tea, you find in a Japanese restaurant, it's bright green tea. It, it's kind of opaque because it's actually made with powder. And it's the entire tea leaf that's powdered. A lot of people don't realize this, but matcha is super packed with polyphenols. You know why? Matcha is grown in a very particular way. 28 days before they pick the, 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 the tea leaf from, to make matcha, they put it under shade. They, put, they, they basically cover it with a canopy and, and the shade is there. So the tea in response to the tea leaf, tea plant, in response to shade, actually wants to make more polyphenols. So they make anywhere from... 30 to 300 times more polyphenols mm. under the shade, all right? And then what happens when you pick the leaf, you cut off the stem, and then they powder, they dry and powder the entire leaf. And so that's why you have so much more polyphenol. It's like um, a stress response to not having a, enough a, sun. First is a stress response to the plant, but then you get more, rather than having it in a tea bag or loose tea leaves, you actually powder the entire leaf. So you're getting the entire leaf, including all the polyphenols. Mm. So you drink all the polyphenols, which is why you get 30 to 300 times more than just dunking a tea bag, you also get the dietary fiber. Good for your gut microbiome. So matcha tea actually is quite amazing. I actually done a study to show that that, that um, matcha tea extracts can kill breast cancer stem cells. Wow. I'm, I'm always amazed by that because look, as somebody who's been involved with biotech development um, and cancer treatment development, finding something that could kill stem cells, cancer stem cells, like breast cancer stem cells, which is what makes cancers come back, is a holy grail. We don't have a drug for it, but here, matcha tea actually been shown in the lab to actually be able to do that to me is actually really jaw dropping. Then going down into even more fermented tea, because traditionally, again, you know, this idea that in our wellness community, we wind up having all these mantras, um, must drink green tea and oxidized fermented tea is no good. Turns out that's not true. The science is showing that oolong tea, which is slightly fermented, also good for your metabolism. You can lose your waist, you can shrink your waist size, your waist circumference, lose body fat. And then even perhaps more surprising, if you take the extreme of fermented smoky dark teas, there's a tea that I write about called Pu'er tea, P-U apostrophe E-R-H. Favorites. One of your favorites, right? Yeah. One of mine as well. Uh, this is comes from a village of Pu'er that um, back thousands of years actually traded tea on the Silk Road. So they smoked the tea, they fermented it, so it would actually survive the tea journey. And it turns out research had been done to show that poor tea 
lights up your brown fat, burns up, you know, triggers your fat, excess fat burning by burning the cells, uh, decreases your stem cells from making more fat, uh, and fi whites, uh, fats, visceral fat as well. Quite remarkable that this fermented tea that supposedly, you know, fermented, it's not, can't be good, doesn't have any of the polyphenols left, wrong. And on top of that, they've actually discovered just a few years ago that there is this, this tradition, thousand year old tradition of making Pu'er tea. There's even a bacteria, a probiotic that actually is, the bacteria is grown in the way that's fermented. In fact, they call it a Pu'er psyllis, uh, like a bacillus <laughs> that actually grows in Pu'er tea. So this is actually a, a probiotic tea, which to me is remarkable and not only does it improve gut health, it's good for your metabolism as well. So it fires up your brown fat. So again, you know, tea is the second part of the Holy Trinity. The third, um, which I always drink, and you asked me, what did I want? If I, you know, I was coming in to do this podcast with you and I requested a cup of coffee. Coffee has chlorogenic acid and many other polyphenols, but the chlorogenic acid not only boosts your health defenses, um, uh, but it also triggers your metabolism uh, and, and it stimulates your metabolism from going as well. A little bit of the caffeine, which I'm able to tolerate. Not everybody can tolerate caffeine, um, but I'm able to tolerate the caffeine. Caffeine also uh, stimulates not only your kind of like your brain, but also stimulates your metabolism as well. And I'm not encouraging people to go after caffeine. I'm just saying that coffee is one of the, the, the third of the Holy Trinity, coffee, tea, uh, and water that actually is really, really healthy. You know, the beautiful thing about the way you present it is like Pu'er, one of my favorite teas. I drank it so much during college. Yeah. Like I would drink it all the time. And then I had a little bit of a gap. And then I'm thinking recently, I'm like, you know what? It's probably been a year or two since I've had it. Like when you know the information, it's another reminder of like, oh, this thing that I used to enjoy or that I've heard of or that I heard somebody else having, like, wow, like that's exciting for me. And you include it back into your routine. And all this culminates together. And it really goes into this last principle that you talk about in the 10 principles, which is live to eat, right? The joy of searching out, being a food hunter, forager in our modern world, and really leaning into the idea of not being fear-based around food, but actually, you know, I'll let you set it up. You know, sometimes we hear this phrase, like people say, oh, do you eat to live or do you live to eat? And almost like live to eat has a demeaning tone that people give it in that capacity. Talk about how you're representing it to the audience. Yeah, well, in my book, one of the things that I really try to, and I hope the readers get this, convey is that we don't need to fear our food. The, the very foods that taste great can be actually good for us if we're mindful about how we eat it and when we eat it and all that kind of other stuff and, and, and to find good combinations of it and that these are connected to our old traditions. And that's really how I really became very mindful of this whole idea of um, living to eat. So I did a gap year before I went to medical school to become a doctor. Um, I, I was a biochemist in college and um, I was very enamored by history. And I was always interested in the Mediterranean because when I studied, I took a very influential course called the Renaissance History of Man. And that course fascinated me because it was really talking about that inflection point between the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, and the Renaissance, sort of the Enlightenment, and all the incredible arts and sciences and literature explosion of culture that occurred um, uh, during the Renaissance. Right. And I realized something that was really amazing, which is that at any point, like it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't like, you know, one day it was in a dark room. It's called the Middle Ages. And then one day somebody clicked on a light switch and, oh, it's a Renaissance. No, this actually took place over hundreds of years that this evolution actually occurred. And, it, and I realized that there was something really valuable about this idea of, of growing to a higher light, a, a, a stage of enlightenment that occurs over time. I really wanted to see where this occurred, which happened to be in the Mediterranean that I, we were studying in Italy and Greece. So I really wanted to get over to this, study it. And then I also realized that the food traditions also, as part of my study, changed dramatically between the Middle Ages, where people were just like, you know, cooking, you know, those gigantic, um, you know, Bronto burgers over a fire to really beginning to, um, understand how ingredients melded together you know the the simmering and the cooking and the stewing like these were not medieval age you know you did have cavemen who were doing that but really sort of during the middle age that's when the modern asian and mediterranean 
uh, actually t- cooking techniques came into being. So I wanted to see this. So before I went to medical school, I did a gap year and I went to Italy. I kind of embedded myself, so to speak. And I was, um, uh, I lived with the family and I was there explicitly to study the link between food and culture and health. I wanted to see what it was like over there in Italy, in Greece. I traveled all around Italy. Um, uh, and, and I actually also did some cooking uh, for the families I was living with. Uh, in Greece, I went to a monastery. Uh, I, I literally volunteered to be a cook in the monastery uh, <laughs> one day because the abbot announced that the, the chef uh, monk was sick, had the flu. And they needed volunteers and who knew how to cook. And so I raised my hand and off I went in there. We were stirring uh, a ginormous pot of beans with a canoe paddle, literally, and cooking for the entire monastery. This is like wow. cooking Easter feast. And, you know, um, and, and to me, that experience burned into my brain while I was living there that people really enjoyed their food. They knew about their food. They talked about their food. They looked forward to their food. So, you know, if you go to Mediterranean, um, anyone, if, if you knew, have a friend in Italy or in Greece and, and, and they took you out to a meal or cooked a meal for you, while you sat down with your meal, they would be talking about their food. Italians talk about what they're eating as they're eating it, and they talk about the season it is and how to prepare it and different nuances about it. People are passionate about their food. Same thing in Asia, you know, and, and you know, I, I would imagine the same thing as in India. People take the time to prepare their food, and when they serve it, that's what people talk about. They talk about their food, and, and they really, really relish it and enjoy it. And they look forward to their next meal. I think to me, I learned that was the antithesis of what I came back to when I went to medical school, Mm. where we were so rushed. You know, we were so busy. We didn't have time to eat. And so when you sat down, it was really just a pile in some sustenance and to get through, to get to the next thing. And that to me was, um, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to live to eat as opposed to just eat to live, to pile in some calories so I can keep going. I think I've I've really lived my life that way, and what I hope for people who read my book is that they're, they'll they'll really they'll really see from the way that I write about food that it's something that I I enjoy, it's passionate, and that it's something that you can really look forward to. Like when I was writing some of the things uh, that I wrote, I actually I wrote part of this book by the way in the Mediterranean. I went back, I was doing some research um, in places, um, and I finished I finished my book actually in Greece. I was on a Greek island. Um, and I went to a little writing cave and the food that I would eat, like I would write about afterwards and it would make my mouth water to write about mm. the food I just ate uh, all over again. So, you know, I hope people, I hope readers really get this idea. Like, please don't fear your food, you know, um, love your food. And it's just so amazing that we're so fortunate actually to be able to, you know, benefit from societies and histories and cultures that have actually figured out a lot of stuff for us. Um, uh, and, and now what's cool is that science is bringing us really to the cutting edge, that forefront, where we begin to understand why the things that taste so great are actually so great. 